When thinking about materials and objects as a maker, it's important to consider the impact these materials and objects have. In a first instance, that can involve considering the life cycle of materials and constructing objects well, so they are cared for and passed on rather than discarded. But what does it mean to create an object well? And what does it mean to create these objects that get passed on? These objects could also be referred to as kinship objects. A thought that crossed my mind upon finding a small book that packs a punch titled The Material Kinship Reader, edited by Chris Dittle and Clementine Edwards. Jonathan Marks says in a cultural, meaningful sense, kinship is a way of defining social networks, establishing obligations, and organizing the transmission of property across generations. What role do materials and objects play in the organization of social relationships? What does it mean to possess materials and objects? And where does possession start? A challenging question when you think about some of the materials commonly associated with jewelry, like mined gemstones and extracted gold. But also when thinking of wedding rings, for example, do these objects perpetuate certain kinship ideals? And what are the dangers in that? With all these questions swirling in my mind, I'm extremely excited to be joined today by the artist and jewelry maker responsible for triggering these thoughts in the first place, Clementine Edwards, to discuss their work and to ponder these interesting, necessary and challenging topics with me. I'm excited to welcome Clementine. Hi, thank you for having me. To start, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do? I am an artist and an editor. I am a writer and a jeweler. Editor just rolled off my tongue kind of naturally. That's sort of a past life, but I tend to fall back into it sometimes. I, I rephrase. I'm an artist and writer and jeweler. What do I do? I have the great luxury of being an almost full-time artist, uh, which is something that's very rare and something that is not possible in many, many places in the world. I live in the Netherlands, which still has a relatively good system of funding and supporting artists. So I spend my days doing all different things. It really depends on what my projects are. So you studied a BA, gold and silversmithing, at RMIT and now work across sculpture, jewellery, film, performance and writing, as you say. What attracted you to the subject of jewellery, though, initially and encouraged you to then expand your practice beyond the making of objects only? Jewellery was certainly my first love, as far as it goes, uh, in relation to aesthetic experience um, and interest. I think something certainly that I recall saying in my BA entry interview to Gold and Silversmithing about my attraction to jewellery was its democratic nature, the capacity for, of course, as a conversational conversation starter element of jewellery, but also its, its sort of um, accessibility, the capacity for anyone to engage with it to touch it for its um, mobility, <laughs> for its uh, transmission scope, for its material sensibilities often. That came later, I should say. Um, but also I am a huge fan of the small in scale. I think there's something about the small in scale coming together with something worn on the body that enables it to bring about lots of conversation, but also to move in, in different ways. I, I like the, the, the idea of uh, wonder that you find in the small in scale. You know, the smaller and smaller it becomes, the more majestic. And there's actually a, a work of fiction in the book, The Material Kinship Reader, that, that touches on that, called In the Reign of Herod the Fourth by Stephen Milhauser, which I would recommend reading to any any craft or jewellery lovers, because it is really about, um, yeah, craft and magic and and the small in scale. To, to zoom in 
to see from all angles, to spend time is, is interesting, I think, as well in, in your practice. Yeah, actually, I think that's a good point. And I think in that and in jewellery, there is this attention. I wouldn't say attention economy because I don't, I don't mean it in that way. I, I mean, what does it mean to pay attention? And I think that zooming in also calls for a slowing down. Something that I love about jewellery and making, um, I do predominantly when I make sculpture work small in scale or com component-wise small in scale to make larger things. Um, but I do love that dropping away of time that happens with a kind of a, a, a craft or a practice. Your practice is guided by material kinship as you say in your biography in the book as well, thinking material beyond extraction and kinship beyond the biological. Could you tell us a little bit more about this material kinship and, and that in your practice? I'll start with material because that connects quite strongly to your previous question. My thinking around this really began in around 2015 and I was, I got post-traumatic stress disorder um, and it was uh, as a um, white educated femme presenting person, it was a kind of a world breaking moment in the sense that this was the, I had extreme ex experienced traumas beforehand, but this was something much more catastrophic. It was a post-traumatic stress disorder based on really horrific uh, sexual violence. And at that time, something I found in myself was that I would feel happiest and best and um, also, I suppose, most in control. I mean, that's not necessarily a term I promote, but um, I think it can be important when one is experiencing uh, complex PTSD. When I was working on on my artwork, on my jewelry, and on my on my making, so material at that point in time when the living world came to feel quite unstable and untrustworthy and uh, unruly <laughs> uh, and dangerous, even material came to be a reliable place to return to. And when I say material, I really do mean it in the jeweler's sense, kind of going back to the small things in front of us at the bench, at the, at the studio desk. So I, it was a kind of, it came of a cynical moment in my life, a de desire to treat material as my family, as a thing that I could hold on to and rely on not to change. But of course, Little by little, one discovers that that's utter bullshit and doesn't is not a thing that happens and is not a, a real thing. But it was a very important moment for me at that point in time. And that's a point in time also, I think, trauma being a world-breaking uh, moment is when you start to question all the biggest uh, structures and systems uh, that shape the world around you. Kind of the veil might <laughs> drop down in a way in terms of how things work. So that was a, an awakening, I think, um, something that, gosh, I could, there are so many different directions I could take this in, but I'm, I'm gonna, trying to keep it focused uh, or like a uh, starting point. So I was thinking about material as something I could rely on, something I could treasure, something I, I started at this point in time thinking about at kind of breaking all the rules I'd learned at Gold and Silversmithing School, as in not transcending the material or not, um, which is something Robert Baines, who was my teacher, would, was very big on, but rather looking at the materials individually, the little, the, the residues of daily experience um, and looking at how to, say, honour them or kind of present them in a way that kind of upheld and, and honoured the relationships through which they had been come into my hands. So I started making works not taught speaking to or of the violence of the trauma, but rather speaking to and of the relationships that were carrying me through. So these were both the materials and the people around me. And so I started making these very mm, kind of precarious, wobbly, 
sculptures that might deinstall themselves in the wind or with a bump of a table. So the material element starts there. The kinship element in, in what I mentioned with the, the kind of world-breaking moment, I started thinking about the... the um, so I think about the violence of the family unit, of the reproductive family unit, of the nuclear family. Just to be clear, the sexual violence stuff happened outside of that. So I just wanted to be uh, to um, yeah make that point. But the family unit and the reproductive femme and the particularly the white uh, reproductive heterosexual cis family unit being kind of the basic capitalist building block and this is how you make a bit good producing, consuming society, kind of like build one of them and put them next to the other and then you create a, a context that is controlled, etc. So I guess, sorry, this is like a massive spiral. I'm just trying to like, um, I think the kinship thing, questioning, I, it started from like a cynical place. I want to be akin with, my mater with materials and then like, oh, well, that's utter bullshit and then looking at my kinship structures around me, which were predominantly and not limited to, to but uh, very queer and kind of operating in very uh, in non-normative nuclear kind of ways. And I started, once I questioned the material, and I was like, oh, but why would I say kinship about the material? Then I started questioning the kinship and, and that kind of, it kind of expanded from there. I think that's where I'll leave it. <laughs> We can read the book as well, which I think gives a sort of open debate about what material kinship can be. This is kind of where it began for me and it spiralled in many, many different directions, but I, I've seen it. I, I, I don't want to close down the term because it's just a, a concept, an artistic concept that came to guide the way I think and make and the directions that I work. But certainly I invite anyone that engages with the concept to see where it might take them and hopefully radicalise them because that's always the aim. But, yeah, just to, to add that. Questions around gender, gendering, caring for, or you mentioned repairing from trauma are really themes that struck me the most in sort of the texts you wrote alongside the images that featured your work in the book. Could you perhaps share a little bit more about sort of how your visual practice responds to it? I find it hard to find a term for that because it's not quite visualize or or revisit these types of themes and and how art can can help us to to make them discussable, maybe make them accessible and 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 demystify so that we can repair or grow or yeah I thought I'd I'd ask that question as well so I'll start with the point on repair because that word is meaningful to me in at a particular point in time in my life and I think in that sense I see repair in a I I look at the concept of repair in many ways quite cynically as the person that I am, as this idea of recuperation to a person that you were before. And I, I don't think, I mean, of course, that's not possible. But I think the, per, the the question of who has access or right to repair or recuperate or live in a context or timeline in which trauma is not your everyday or et cetera, that, that question is an open one and certainly one that is different for everyone asking and answering it. I, I think when I speak about material kinship, something that was really amazing for me at that time was its capacity to asking these questions and these questions' capacity to speak back to me and radicalise me. And I say radicalising like the kind of political sense and I personally aim to be able to continue as I get older to push back against the <laughs> undertow or tides of normalisation, say that's not the right term, but this kind of current that is constantly wanting to push us into, say, the family unit, into reproductive, into consumption, into possession, to push back against that kind of capitalist uh, 
aspirational element that does become more pressing as one does get older. And I am 40 years old and certainly through my 30s seeing uh, people around me start to enter into that kind of nuclear family rubric of kind of reproduction and um, put, buy a new house and kind of then focus on the kids, etc. And I think that's magic and I, for myself, it's something I, I want to push back against. So why am I saying that? Growth. I think radicalization in terms of growth. You speak about how I, how I speak of the, of the works in the book. And I think as a person with a background before I was a jeweler, I was working in publishing and I continue to work in publishing and I also did have a background in politics and literature, et cetera. So I have like an academic tendency and there's the possibility of kind of getting carried away in words. And there's something gorgeous about the legibility of materials. And I think the way I speak about the materials in the kind of expanded captions in the book, because I sort of am narrating them and where they come from, creating a sort of family tree or lineage, very personal of these materials. I think that is certainly wanting to pay tribute to that legibility of material or the possible kind of ways in which or open ways in which material might communicate beyond, uh, not beyond words, but, you know, kind of in other ways, other sensual ways. When I'm working materially, sculpturally or with wearables, I work very often instinctively. So I... I um I I work via things that come to me, things that are given to me, things that are found on the ground while having you know going for a walk with someone I care for or do not care for. <laughs> so these things come to me in a relatively organic way, um, but certainly not always. I have no qualms about um, buying a ring at a know discount store if I see it and love it and want to put it in a in a work that I'm working on for instance a friend of mine once described it as gathering through encounter that they kind of like come into my orbit <laughs> just through encounters um it's not a forced thing so I think in that sense the creation process although I, I can look back and describe say this kind of period that we've been discussing with a, a certain kind of uh, makes it sound like there's a uh, perhaps clarity at the time it was just a finding my way through and I think my practice itself is very much about engaging with the residues of daily life really not just the material but also the effective but also the kind of experiential the things that and where we are how we are how we're feeling, what we're doing, what we're reading, what we're seeing, ticket stubs in our pocket, the tea we drank that morning, whatever. These elements are really central to the way in which I work and think. And that kind of goes back to the gathering through encounter. Sometimes it's just like kind of just whatever happened that day. So things enter my orbit and sometimes stick. <laughs> Sometimes I'll make a really quick sculpture or work and then that's the thing and I'll give it away or I'll present it, whatever. Um, other times they'll kind of become an artwork and then they'll live their life as the artwork in my studio. Other times I'll, I'll pull apart the artwork and it will kind of re-enter my studio in pieces. So the creation process is organic, often just about kind of similar to what we're talking about before just sitting and staring at the materials for a very long time, moving them around, thinking about it, stitching, playing, experimenting. So there's that. And then the sharing element is really, I suppose, an invitation. Certainly many people would see my work and have no idea what it's about. And I think the more uh, educated I get self-educated, I mean, in this sense right now, um, but kind of aware of the processes that I'm kind of busy with, say, 
the easier it is to get it bogged down in all of that and um, sort of charge it, try to charge it with that retroactively, et cetera, et cetera. But um, this did just start from a place of playing around and taking great comfort in making and kind of questioning certain capitalist forms, et cetera, et cetera, and then being attracted to poetry and what does that, and then like visual poetry, et cetera. So it just kind of, it, it did just develop, I think, in the end, an artist could say their work is about anything and it's about that thing. It's just um, I, I've i been making videos and, and writing a little bit lately and something that I'm thinking about a lot is, oh, gosh, I just want to make. I just want to make because something about the making, for me, something clicks and it just becomes a whole lot easier. One thing I want to say about making also is... Um, in terms of access, I also mean it as access in like a crip justice, disability justice sense, uh, in an economic sense, etc. I was many years ago, I was in a, a, a group called the Victorian Association of Miniature Enthusiasts. And this is a very, Victoria as in Australia, uh, the state, one of the many colonised states of Australia. But it was predominantly older, lower socioeconomic women, kind of 60 plus, making miniatures. Um, there's like a very rich miniature society out there in Australia at least, and certainly I know in, in Europe. I'm not sure about the UK, but um, I imagine so. Where these women have like a corner in their house and they're just cutting stuff out and like working and making these tiny little houses with bricks and et cetera, et cetera. But that was... Um, an eye-opener in terms of it, it had me thinking about the small and scale of access uh, and also had me thinking about health. I have um, chronic asthma, so there are times when I am not able to move, really, to get around. And when I'm sick, the two things I turn to are reading and making making in a very simple, instinctive, cutting out, like not even I barely have a jewellery set up in, in my studio in Rotterdam at the moment, kind of gluing and cutting and that sort of thing. These are the things that really come from a place of joy, I suppose, and feel much, although there's lots of information behind them that I have, I can kind of, set that 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 can just sit beside me or around me or wherever somewhere less present while I'm in that process and I think that process of of making is really precious and I think something that I certainly learned from my jewelry practice um yeah one interview with Heather Davis was about plastic and I really that struck a chord with me because you know plastic as it says in the book it played a large role in your material kinship research is this material that we can easily find a lot of <laughs> many colors it's easy to cut it responds to most glues it's this sort of accessible material that many people do also use in crafting and and, and making things themselves and then you discuss also sort of plastic's ability to crack time with Heather Davis could you tell us maybe a little bit about that specific material in your practice and your interest in plastic as a as a maker and a thinker I love that that quote from Heather plastic cracks time I think it's so beautifully articulates and brings to mind precisely what she talks about. And through reading her, I was introduced to this idea of it cracking time. She she says, speaks of it kind of being quote unquote man-made, um, but outside of biological life cycles. So it's something that kind of, um, there's also alongside that interview, a 1950s text from Roland Barthes, very short, but written about kind of the magic and marvel and promise of, uh, of plastic. And I love those two texts alongside each other because there's this kind of modernist idea of um, man freewheeling over nature, which is what uh, Roland Barthes says 
in gorgeous poetic ways, giving a man a measure of his power um, because it, it's something that is derived of the Earth's archives. Um, it is made of, um, you know, oil, which is all the mollusks and sedimentation and plant matter, et cetera, from all those millions of years. And then through this elaborate human process or processes, it becomes something that is outside of biological time and outside of the kind of very place like most things in the world beyond synthetics where they come from. So it's kind of that concept, plastic cracking time was interesting. She, Heather Davis has a, or had, she wrote one text, it was very influential to my thinking and then her uh, has shifted a lot but in 2016 she wrote about kind of she was thinking about queer plastic this idea of plastics potential that may not be the right word but um in the sense that it it um does actually it's it's not in an necessarily innate thing it's um it's 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 affecting environments around us and uh, seeping into, it is in and of us. And when I say us, I mean really literally every us that is capable of listening to sound and beyond. I guess my mind was kind of blown to think that it was everywhere and in our umbilical cords, in the umbilical cords of children and, um, you know, like all sorts of elements. In our, in our, I loved, I'm a big tea drinker, like a, a good subject. And there's lots of plastic particles in tea bags. So that, that thrilled me at the time and blew my mind. It's, it's something that's much more broadly accepted these days, but it's something that really affected me. And, and I was working on a show while thinking about plastic, while thinking about or in my first kind of formal queer relationship. And so these things kind of came together. I guess thinking about kin making with it like I, I think it was also a, a, a moment when this idea of this modernist idea of being apart from or outside of nature was really kind of taking hold in my head in a very real sense 2018-19 when I read the text for the first time that Heather Davis wrote and thinking about how queerness and it's kind of uh, different types of futurities that queerness presents um, can take hold or articulate through plastic. Given that we are talking about the book, what was the aim of the book? And you co-edited it with Chris Dittle. You know, how did the project start? What what does that sort of work mean to your practice as well as the, the finding of text, the bringing that together the debating it with others the timing on these questions is impeccable because the book came about uh just after this plastic show that i was doing in 2019 um chris dittle who is a curator had said oh would you ever i for the plastic show i put together a mini reader of quotes that were meaningful to me because i was making this big sculpture of these plastic uh, floral foam bricks. It was the first and only time I think I really embraced uh, just consumption for the sake of, it's the first time I'd had a budget to, while making. And uh, it was the first time I was like, I'm going to go out and get these things and shape them into these Flintstone type bricks. And then upon that lay out this landscape of miniatures. I say this because I had this big work and I was thinking about all the things that you and I have been discussing the capacity for material to speak and in what ways. And I was also thinking, gosh, but I've got all these new ideas and I'm reading theory now. How do I share the stuff that I've learned and kind of put these things together without having a one-hour conversation with you, for instance? Um, so I put together a miniature reader, just a, an A3 page folded in two, so four pages, um, of quotes of, that have been meaningful to me during this process, thinking about um, climate crisis, thinking about um, colonialism and thinking about plastics and how these things might, I mean, in my mind, how these things might come together. The quotes were laid out inde independently of one another. And Chris 
Ditto said to me, would you ever consider doing a book on your work? And I, again, similar to how we've been speaking today, was like, uh, no. <laughs> like, a book on my work would be boring um, and self-aggrandizing, but a book with lots of these threads, I would love to hear some of these people who are speaking in the little mini reader speak in a more expanded sense and speak alongside the work. So to bring these meaningful thinkers and makers into direct, intimate conversation with my work. Um, so it felt a little bit less like, hey, I'm doing an artist monograph, which is something I, I feel kind of personally allergic to, not for other people. I endorse them if you have them and, or want them. That's great. And also I love looking at them, but not for me. So it came about from this conversation in 2019. And then we started working on it in 2020 and we published in 2022. And it was really just started off as kind of weekly meetings. And she's an incredibly experienced fundraiser, which is a big part of curating. And I say that because I we're based in the Netherlands and I think it's really important to emphasise because I know that it's different in the UK, but we were able to make, you know, 20,000 euros fundraising at, throughout over the duration of two years, but the book wouldn't be in existence were it not for that state support. And so I, I flag that because it's not like I just whipped this out of my ass and, you know, happened to have the money lying around. So that really is important to the kind of development or the possibility of this book existing. So we worked on that. We fundraised. We commissioned people. My background in editing, of course, was very useful in that sense. And Chris is in fundraising and we kind of, she's a, a production wonder too. So we we came together and worked with the designer, Jenna Myung, who is US based and made the book. We commissioned six, I believe, texts and we worked with existing texts. Some that were already very dear to me and some that we found along the way. And it was really gorgeous. Um, for instance, Sophie Lewis, who's an English um, writer who has a work in the book, the, the text in there already existed and Chris brought that text on mothering and against mothering, I suppose, into my orbit. So there were the collaborative element was absolutely vital to the to the process and also expanding this idea of material kinship did the that that type of project have an influence then on your practice as well so as you are collecting these texts and combine them back with your work or sort of choose orders and did that then lead to anything past the book as well a change in your practice a, a, an an evolution when we were making the book, certainly I, ha I did make materially less. At the time, I was also teaching at the Dutch Art Institute where I had studied a course with Casco Art Institute. And so there, there was a, a solid period, and this was, of course, during the kind of peak COVID moment where I was really kind of desk-bound, I suppose, or research-bound and much more kind of text and theoretically engaged, meeting, uh, lots of administrative work too, a lot of administrative work. So it affected, in, in that sense, in the day-to-day -day sense, I was, I was making less. We always knew that we wanted to put images of my work from individual shows kind of as mini chapter breaks between the texts. And that's curation, I suppose of order and placement that came really uh, quite late in the process after we had kind of an idea of word count and number of texts and um, we then we kind of put them into a constellation together it could be in a way its own kind of um, sculpture no like when you think about it as a constellation and placement of different visuals and texts really the book has become like my thesis it is something that is so vital or, and important to me as a resource that I look back on because it's something, yeah, you, you, you self-generate, but there are quotes in there that are meaningful to you for a reason. 
And then there are texts that you revisit and it's like, oh, shit, like that is really important. Like I might have a time away and before you and I met, I had a quick scan through the introduction. I was like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. Like I don't have those things on the tip of my tongue every day. And I think in, in, in the way that uh, a thesis is useful as a resource, I think a miniature reader is useful as a resource. I think a collection of quotes is useful as a resource. And certainly this book keeps me kind of remembering, actually. It's like a, a wonderful material archive of some of the things that I have been thinking alongside a bunch of other people. And so I, I guess I just wanted to mention that because it, it certainly gives a more kind of brings what could be a practice that is very amorphous and interested in a whole bunch of different things into a kind of um, more grounded, solid shape. It's something that I can hold on to and return to. And I think that's certainly been the ongoing gift of this book to me personally, in the same way that my thesis is, master's thesis, actually I didn't have a jewellery thesis, but my master's thesis was. Uh, but the more you read your own texts, that sounds like, you know, the, the things that you've said about that you think, it kind of, it settles differently. Um, but also I think it's nice a nice way to honour the way you're moving changes and shifts over time. Particularly as well when you're starting to question some of the things you've always taken for granted, then you start to look back on certain things you wrote or said or in the past and, and spot those kinds of underlying patterns that you were perpetuating on that one I think one that's been hugely um central for me has been like um, coming into awareness of my whiteness over the years and thinking about whiteness in relation to possession actually which really of course relates to materials as like a, a white Australian person yeah my my inheritance is one of land theft in the sense that not that I have inherited it directly, but as a as a kind of my very existence is predicated on the um, dispossession of indi Indigenous land and all the kind of horrors that go alongside that dispossession. Um, so this concept of possession and what it means to have, to hold, to be in possession of one's own body, I, I see these as very questions that that white people need to be working on, actually, because I think thinking about property thinking about ownership, thinking about land and borders, et cetera, is a very historically colonial thing that has been kind of propagated. It's a very successful story. And, and, I, and when you think about it in relation to materials passing through hands over the years and thinking about conditions that enable that possession to unfold and then you kind of expand it, you zoom out from the micro to the macro like well, who has the right to have a, who, who can even not just afford or inherit money in order to buy a house, but how? <laughs> how does that happen? How are these people here wealthy at, as a result of those people in that far off place or nearby place being dispossessed or withheld from being able to possess a sense of control or not sense, a literal capacity to have agency over their own personal body and I think this extends in the everyday in a British context um, to policing of black bodies for instance black and brown bodies having a sense of being in possession of one's own body in a public space is something that is very as I said earlier depends on who you are and how you appear uh, which of course resonates and would, is relevant for a whole bunch of people listening but I say that because that's something that has uh, something that I've learned about and thought about a lot in this kind of uh, quote unquote journey. <laughs> I've started with an in incredible amount of privilege by just the color of my skin, which is, yeah, something that you need to realize and try and ensure that you build a future where that isn't a reality moving forward. The book poses a real critique of capitalist society in a non sort of economic sense even and offers 
you know, even some considerations for a future beyond capitalism. So as an artist, what are your thoughts sort of on that subject of capitalism, but also in a sense of you have to find a way to function within it and at the same time challenge it? What is quite central to this question of, say, operating within this kind of late capitalist depraved system is, A, working on it, not just realising, but it's, it is like craft, like making, it is a practice, it is a practice that one, the more, um, the easier it is to forget, the more work one has to do, I think. And, and I think that that point of can shift across contexts. So, for instance, as a femme presenting person in the Netherlands, it's kind of fine for me. Like I don't get much, it's fine for me in terms of the kind of gender harassment or kind of feelings of that kind of realm of violence that might be prevalent in a, in a different context, which isn't to say that I don't need to work on it and think about it. But so I think there's the, the work question and, and um, I think there's also, I'm thinking about capitalism and its hugeness and then one's own sphere of influence and there's this tendency particularly in art realms because we're busy with these big questions and I do it myself is to be overwhelmed or kind of swallowed by those and like well what what can I even do like I'm just one person and you know, I'm this and this and this and I'm busy with that and I've got to go out and work and do this in order to just have be able to afford my rent to pay for that tiny little table in that shitty little studio. Like those things are real, but thinking about one's own sphere of influence, I think, and like working within that as a starting point. So identifying one's um, contexts I think is absolutely central to being <laughs> empowered <laughs> to recognising that one always is in some capacity, um, in many capacities, looking around at who you're interacting with and the conversations that are kind of unfolding there and how can those contexts, what can you do within those contexts? In terms of sphere of influence, also recognising the limitations and not, I think, a big part of the work of working through one's own kind of privileges or things that can overwhelm you in terms of, oh, but shit, like I'm this or I'm that, is um, is like agency and not succumbing to the, the guilt element or actually that's private work that needs to be done, uh, say like kind of white guilt, which is really a big thing in Australia, um, kind of well, not guilt so much as shame, like the shame of being a settler. That, that's work that needs to be done in private or around other people who present like you. And I think in terms of sphere of influence, that's really like a very fertile starting point um, for, say, so we're talking about a group of um, culturally similar people from wherever place, like to work together, do reading groups, think about it, et cetera. And I think those small steps and keeping in mind where one is in the world, not feeling like you need to be there and there, but you are you are where you are and that is like, that is the right place for now. And how can you work within that context? It's like, I guess my main thing that I also have to remind myself of. You know, in a world where we know the dangers of human-centered thinking, do you feel the medium of jewelry and jewelers could and should make a contribution to sort of the debates around a post-anthropocentric world? Well, there are two ways I could answer this question. First, I think jewellery already is and does. <laughs> of course, when you think about where jewellery comes from and it's kind of occupying a kind of place of devotion or mediumship between other worlds, etc., uh, like, you know, adornment and kind of connection to God or spirits or... But I also think the question of if jewellery can or should, I would... I, I say 
I was busy with questions of jewellery itself as a separate thing to art as long as I was working specifically in jewellery. And as soon as I stepped out, I was like, just get busy with all the stuff that's already there and you recognise that you're already doing it. It's already happening. There are makers, uh, there are different types of practitioners who are, just because they don't show it, um, you know, like a key, like just because they don't show it schmuck or just because they've never been to schmuck, say, for instance. Um, I should say I've never been to schmuck. <laughs> Doesn't mean that it's not jewellery or kind of busy with these, these very questions. And I think um, there are a couple of, interesting programs out there that are certainly testing that i think jewelry need like as a as a practice or a discipline say almost needs to let go of its own questioning self-questioning i think because it's doing all the stuff that it is questioning itself about and the more it's busy with that the more it holds itself up from doing those having those conversations um before we started this interview, we were talking about your practice, Sophie, and I was just like, my eyes were goggling because I haven't spoken with a jeweler in a moment <laughs> or, you know, like a kind of a, a more established jeweler in a, in a moment about their work. I'm like, oh my God, this is just like liquid gold. Like, this is so juicy. I, I said to Sophie that I, I want to inter in interview you because I have so many questions about what you're doing and like thinking about like the connections and how it relates to all the narrative, all the conversations that are already happening. Like it's all there. I think everyone's already doing it. I think it's just the question that's kind of um, fencing in the um, making of the connections. I think jewellery is just another way, a gorgeous and kind of skilled way of questioning the world around us right and that's what art is all about and that's what makes it so hard <laughs> oh, it's so hard it's the hardest job it doesn't matter how hard other jobs are. it's the hardest job because it's got no edges these things have no edges and as soon as you recognize or understand that your own jewelry practice has no edges <laughs> then it's going to get harder and harder and busier and busier with the questions that you ask. Clem, you're currently on a residency in Sweden. Is there anything you are now working on that you are happy to share with us at this stage? I'm thinking while I'm in Sweden about family structures, about inheritance, about lineage and about what is communicated within the family tree or and different methods of citation around questions of family, who gets remembered, ancestry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what's passed down, what is deemed to be kind of like noteworthy and, and not. Um, so I have biological family in living in Stockholm. So in a way, this is also an elaborate ruse to spend more time with them. Um, my nibblings live here and I absolutely adore them. Yeah, I think it's just a continuation of all the conversations we've had today, but specifically thinking through citation and lineage and inheritances. Material Kinship wishes to rethink models of social relations towards non-normative kin-making and to consider the reproductive potential of the insentient. Thinking with and through materials their significance, their origins and life cycles can animate one's relationship to the living and non-living world. As a little pushback against alienation, it can also enliven one's sense of responsibility towards that world. This is a quote from the book that I thought was worth including. How can we all consider material kinship in our practices, challenge norms, and build a better world for the living and non-living. This is not a simple task, and for their efforts in bringing the topic, the underpinning challenges and questions to our attention through a sensitive publication meshing art practice with writing. And for speaking to me today, I would greatly like to thank you, Clem. It was really amazing to hear about your work, and it's been interesting to see what you are thinking and working towards in the future. 
and we very much look forward to keeping an eye on what you do next. Thank you so much for having me. Next month, I'll be joined by another guest, so watch this space to find out who it is. But for now, this was Sophie Boons for the BAJ podcast episode titled Material Kinship with Clementine Edwards. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful day.